Welcome back to class. Let's begin for the day. Our quotations of the day for the next few weeks till December, till the end of the semester, are from Winston Churchill. Kind of an interesting guy if you have never read about him. It's well, well worth reading his biography. Okay, we're going to be talking about the final topics of Chapter 5 today, and we're going to push ahead into Chapter 6, which is about waves. And the reason we need to know about waves is because we're trying to... We're trying to uh, savvy the periodic table. And the periodic table is all about quantum mechanics. And for quantum mechanics, you've got to know a little bit about waves. So that's kind of uh, why we're heading this way. Uh, but uh, what I'd like to do first is just kind of review some of the things we talked about uh, last time in a slightly different detail. So this is a, this is a new little slide I made up. One of the things that when you're talking about thermodynamics and thermal processes, uh, heat energy in general, you have things that um, can change their phase from solid to liquid if you heat it up. And if you extract energy, you can freeze a liquid um, and uh, you can actually condense a gas. That's what rain is. So we've got these phase transitions. That's what they're generally known. There's a fourth state of matter called plasma, and that's pretty rare to find here on Earth. Uh, we have plasma applications here and there. The surface of the sun is a plasma, a hot charged gas uh, with, with thorough ionization. But for us, we're going to talk about liquids, solids, and gases. Now, a liquid can go directly to a solid, um, and that's called freezing or solidification, right? So you wouldn't, in other words, you wouldn't say that uh, molten lava freezes, but you would say it solidifies as it cools. Gaseous, liquid to gaseous state is what we call boiling or in general vaporizing something. Uh, and so if you made tea this morning like we did at our house, um, you boil the water. And that sends uh, H2O as a gas into the atmosphere. Solids can also make phase transitions. Um, whoops. Uh, so a solid can go to gaseous state. This is what CO2 dry ice does. It it's called sublimation, and it, the physical makeup of the CO2 crystal um, is such that it allows it to go straight from solid to gaseous state at um, normal, everyday human um, conditions. But a solid can also melt. And we call it dry ice because it doesn't actually get wet. It just goes straight to a, you know, it doesn't leave a pool, uh, at least if you're on this planet. Um, solid to liquid is melting, of course. And then gaseous matter uh, makes a phase transition to either of the other two. Uh, for instance, uh, a gaseous transition to liquid phase is called condensation. That's what rain does. Rain is a condensation of the water vapor in the atmosphere. Once that water vapor rises to a high enough altitude and the sun's heating it up, but now it's up there where it's also really cold, and at some point, depends on the day, it'll be up right at the right atmosp atmospheric uh, altitude. It'll be cold enough and the air pressure will be just right and that water will relax down uh, to a, a liquid state and form droplets. So you see clouds. Every cloud you see is a bunch of little mini droplets that are so small they haven't become raindrops yet. Some clouds ne never do. Ex exception to that is uh, cirrus clouds. 
You know the one that looks the ones that are way up there and they look real wispy. Those are actually ice crystals, uh, and they come out of the atmosphere uh, as ice or into the atmosphere as ice. Another transition from gaseous to solid uh, is called deposition. So in other words, if you have some vaporized gold, you can deposit it at the right pressure and temperature directly into a solid. And that's how a lot of your, like I was fooling around with a SIM card, a bunch of SIM cards last night for my son's phone. And a lot of, those, a lot of your electronics have a very thin layer of gold. All right, and that's because gold is a really good conductor, and it doesn't corrode, stuff like that. So um, when you want to make a really thin layer of gold on top of copper, for instance, you can uh, do that. Another word for it is epitaxy, which is, has nothing to do with Uber or cabs. It just means that you're slapping something on top of another layer. Epi means above or on top of. Okay, your epidermis, you know, your epidermis is showing. That means your skin. Did you ever see that when you were a little kid? Oh, man, your epidermis is showing. Hey, look, you know, they look down and, oh, man, my, you know, it's like a third grade joke. Anyways, epidermis means the top layer of your, of your skin. All right, so you can do that. And, and a lot of our fancy physics and chemistry labs, they do a, something called molecular beam epitaxy. They just basically shoot a beam of molecules straight out of surface and just kind of, kind of like a spray paint almost. You know, they, it's like spray painting, only it's because of heat, not pressure. Now here's another look at these same phase transitions, and I rearrange them. You can do whatever you want. I rearrange these so that the gaseous uh, is up here on top and solid is down here on the bottom. And the reason I do that is because they have a higher energy per atom uh, in a gaseous state. And, of course, the solid is lower energy per atom. So um, it's, you know, you can't really have uh, a crystal gas, a gas made of crystals. You know, it's kind of a contradiction. You can have a carbon gas. You, know, you can have an H2O gas, an H2O vapor, you can have H2O crystals, and they can exist at the same temperature, uh, but you can't really say that um, something is crystalline and also a gas. So they have to make a, a phase transition between the two. And really, you can say that the, the difference between gaseous, liquid, and solid is the amount of interatomic interaction or intermolecular interaction forces. So a solid has such strong intermolecular forces that it will actually bond together in a regular metallic array or a crystalline array or maybe as a glass or some kind of a solid. Whereas a gaseous, uh, the temperature, the average kinetic energy is so high they can't get organized. They're just, it's like you may have a friend that's so... So uh, scatterbrained and high energy, they're you know they're always rushing here and there, and they never really you know they never really get organized with you on stuff. Okay, that's what a gas is like. So it's way high up in energy relative to a solid. Now here's another factor that I want to mention to you because there's something interesting um, concerning this: the ambient pressure affects whether you can melt something or whether something can go directly from solid to gas. You know, the sublimation of CO2 directly from frozen solid CO2, carbon dioxide ice, dry ice, to gaseous CO2, you know, greenhouse gas, all that, uh, that is dependent on pressure. And theoretically, all the transitions, uh, you know, water ice, um, that we, you know, we see all of its transitions at sea level and, and under normal everyday uh, conditions. But if you have the pressure uh, right, you can see other things from dry ice. So let's take a look at dry ice here. Okay, here's a couple pictures of dry ice. 
Uh, this one on the left is just a stack of dry ice blocks that you might buy at Publix. And uh, this is what it looks like. This is a micro uh, photograph of the crystals. And the interesting thing is that um, dry ice, CO2 ice, you can go ahead and write this concept down, it actually can go to a liquid, but only in high pressure environments. So the ambient pressure, you know, the ambient air pressure of Orlando is not high pressure enough for us to see carbon dioxide to go to a liquid, all right? The only thing we see here uh, is carbon dioxide ice going to a gas, all right, dry ice. But you can do um, uh, straight to a liquid. So let me give you a couple specs on pressure so that you can understand uh, the slide that's coming up on CO2, carbon dioxide, and its phase transitions. Okay, so a few specs on pressure. Uh, in the generic concept is that a pressure is an amount of force per unit area. So for instance, if you have a pair uh, of high heel shoes uh, with the, you know, the really pointy high heel shoes, uh, what do they call that? Stiletto. Stiletto heels, and you know, you walk across a linoleum floor, it'll exert, you know, and you're not that heavy maybe, but it, it, all your weight is concentrated on two little squares at the bottom of your stilet, and you'll leave whole, um, impressions on a linoleum floor. I had a friend in the Air Force, and he uh, was um, a loading, you know, he's a sergeant, and his specialty was loading these big, gigantic transports. And those things can take tanks. They roll a tank up in there, and, you know, they can take all the army men, you know, like two or 300 army men across the ocean and a bunch of tanks and or whatever they want to transport. But he told me, you know, if, if, you know, if somebody were to walk on that floor of that cargo bay in the, in the transport aircraft uh, with high heel shoes, uh, they'd, they'd poke holes in it. And, you know, how many, how many Army soldiers and Marines do you see walking around in high heel shoes? Not many. Not getting out to an airplane. All right? They're going to be wearing boots. In the tanks, they have these big, broad treads to distribute their... And so that's the weight force per unit area, the pressure, is what controls whether you go through the floor of that transport or whether you leave um, uh, marks on a linoleum floor. A knife. You know, a sharp knife. The whole idea of sharpening a knife is to make the knife edge really, really small, really, really thin. And then all the force that you exert is, is concentrated in that forward edge. Now, if it's blunt, it distributes it a little bit more area, and the pressure is not as great. And that is why uh, a sharp knife will be able to separate solids. Okay? And... Anyways, so force per unit area. So just think high heel shoes versus combat boots. Okay? Now, English system, we frequently see this PSI, uh, pounds per square inch. And for instance, a scuba tank mm, might be rated for 3,000 PSI. Anybody here have a scuba tank? Anybody here uh, dive? I don't see, there's got to be a few. Anyways, uh, this is typical for a scoop tank. Metric system uh, is what I normally use, and, but, you know, everyday life uh, PSI is frequently used. Uh, but in the metric system, it's newtons of force per square meter, and it is called the Pascal, after a French scientist named Blaise Pascal, B-L-A-I-S-E. Blaise Pascal, uh, the abbreviation is PA for Pascal, and uh, 100,000 of them is also known in the metric system as a bar. Now, it doesn't have to do with the crossbar 
on the goal post. It doesn't have to do anything with Louis Bar across the street, on the other side of Alfea. It has to do with bar, barometric, from the Greek word for weight, okay, the weight of the atmosphere. Uh, and because it just so happens that atmospheric pressure um, is at, at sea level on a fair day, that's considered a one true atmosphere. Uh, it's about uh, 100,000 pascals. Okay, so the, the weather, this is another definition of, or another rating system for pressure, atmospheres, you know. Um, and if, if you listen to the Weather Channel, you'll hear them talking about millibars. Now, 1,013.25 millibars is considered a fair weather day. And conversely, a hurricane is a dip in the millibars at the center of the storm. So in the eye of Hurricane Patricia that just blasted through Mexico a few weeks ago, lowest central pressure ever recorded, 880 millibars. And the one previous to that was uh, uh, back in 2005, it was 882. Anyways, Hurricane Patricia. So um, it's kind of amazing. Uh, this is a dip of about 10%, a little bit more than 10%. But the effect on the weather is enormous. You know, so 300 miles from the center, you might have 1,013 millibars, a lovely day. And then a slight 10% dip in the air pressure from where you are to the center of the hurricane, enormous change in the, in the weather. So uh, that's what, one of the reasons weather is so hard to predict. Okay, in terms of pascals um, and not bars or millibars, uh, atmospheric pressure, uh, 1.00 atmospheres is considered, um, uh, or 101,325 pascals is considered uh, one atmosphere. Uh, in terms of PSI, about 15, more precisely 14.695. And so your, um, your uh, tires have to have an internal pressure uh, on your car, for instance, 32 PSI. On your bicycle, maybe 60 PSI. And if you pump it up at the gas station, you know, depending on the pump, it has a little gauge. You check to see what the PSI level is. Uh, or you dial it in and you specify the PSI level. Um, another thing that you see in terms of weather is barometric pressure. Um, and this is the only place where they use inches of mercury. Over in Europe, they use millimeters of mercury. Uh, 29.92 inches of mercury in a barometer is kind of an archaic method, but they still use it. Um, and it indicates fair weather. Uh, at sea level. So for instance, if you go up to, to Denver, mile high, the mile high city, uh, it's up in the atmosphere, a little bit higher. So the same fair weather temperature, uh, sunny day up in Denver, it's going to be a little bit lower air pressure there uh, because there's less atmosphere pushing down on you. Less newtons per square meter pushing down on the top of your head and the side of your head, the front and back, your, you know, everything, it's all, it's pressure exerts forces in all directions, but there's less atmosphere up there. If you go down into the ocean, you get an entire, you know, if you're scuba diving or just regular diving, you get an entire atmosphere of pressure, okay, so a thousand millibars, and then you get the pressure of the water on top of that. So if you go down about 33 feet, that's another atmosphere of pressure. So go ahead and make a note of that. 33 feet under the sea. Uh, if you can dive, you can dive that deep. I've, I've, I've made dives that deep without scuba tanks. It's, it's not easy, but you can do it. I mean, if you have the right gear, flippers and stuff like that, fins. Anyway, so that's, that's that. So a little bit of uh, data on pressure. Now, the reason that we're 
we're bringing that up is so we can look at this diagram. All right, so try to copy this diagram. There's a vertical axis. Now, just put those numbers on there. This is the important one down here, 101.4. Uh, that's about atmospheric pressure. All right, so this one down here is, and then you could put 7380 up here and 510.2 over here. And notice that these scales are not, this is not regular graph paper. This is, it, I'm guessing it's a logarithmic scale. But we're not allowed to use logarithms in this class. So we'll just write the numbers down. And they kind of make this graceful line. There's a point where three lines come together. It's called a triple point. And to the left of this first line, um, everything there is for CO2 is going to be a solid. So at these temperatures, 194.7 and 101.4 uh, kilopascals, KPAs, um, you're going to have um, a solid CO2 or it might be uh, gas. At this point right here, this is the uh, boiling point. Uh, excuse me, this is the sublimation point for CO2 right here where my cursor is. Uh, at basically at sea level under normal atmospheric conditions. All right. So right in this area here, in this downward segment, it's kind of curvaceous. Do your best sketching it. All right. Um, that is where you have sublimation. Okay, you go from a solid to a gas. If, you're, if your atmospheric pressure is anywhere over here to the left of that line, um, then you can make, if you um, heat something up, it'll uh, sublimate into a gas if it's uh, carbon dioxide. All right. Now, up here, this triple point, the full specs for that are 5.1 atmospheres approximately and 216.8 kelvins, all right? And that is where um, the liquid state of CO2 kind of wedges itself in there between solid and gas. See, for us, at atmospheric pressure in Orlando or even on top of Mount Everest, for us, there's two temperatures separating um, water, solid, from liquid and then another and, and liquid from solid. So from solid to liquid to, to gaseous uh, water, you know, we've got to go through two phase transitions. And up here at these high pressures up here, starting at 510 kilopascals, 5.1 atmospheres, you start to get three different states at the same pressure and temperature or uh, at the same pressure, and the transition points are here and here, all right, where this dotted line goes across. And right, now this is a NASA.gov uh, diagram, so it's, it's, good, it's good specs, it's good data. All right, and so um, up here, if you're up here above 5.1 atmospheres, okay, you can have some melting up here. Because up here, you're going from solid to liquid, all right? For CO2, you'll get wet ice if you're at that high pressure. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a weird combo because you're high pressure, but you're also cold. Now, when we go to the coldest part of the Earth, you know, like the top of Mount Everest, it's also lower pressure. It's hard to breathe. We don't get enough oxygen. We've got to bring our own scuba tanks up there, our own air tanks. Okay, so that's the way things are on Earth. But, you know, we can get these conditions in the lab, and that's why we know this information. You know, we can control the pressure. We can control the temperature. We can refrigerate it, um, pressurize it, and get this. But, you know, this is, this is Earth right down here. Earth is this, a little pokey region, you know, from the top of Mount Everest down at sea level is a pokey little area down here. And so for us, that's all we see. We see solid to, to
to gas. Uh, but for, for people on some planet that's really cold and a lot of pressure, it's kind of hard to visualize, but uh, you would see, just like water for us, solid to liquid to gas transitions. All right, so um, this is one of the little foibles about CO2. And my final comment about this is, the reason that this happens is that the CO2 molecule forms different intermolecular bonds when it becomes a solid compared to what H2O molecules do. H2O molecules have a way different shape and a different mass than CO2. All right, so CO2 has a lot different physical properties based on what its molecule does at all these different temperatures up here. Now, I, I want to get back to working with ice uh, made of H2O. And what we're going to do is something, I believe we started with this last time. Get your clicker ready. We're going to try to melt some water. And let's just go through the specific heat concepts that we began last time. And just to reinforce them, Tyler, we're going to go nice and easy. And I've got a few extra slides to reinforce things. Now, as I mentioned last time, the metric standard is water, liquid water. A calorie is the amount of energy that it takes to raise one gram uh, of liquid HCO by one Kelvin. And that tells you the specific heat for liquid water. All right, so you would, you would specify the specific heat as uh, 1.00 calories per gram per Kelvin. Okay, the textbook might, depending on the textbook that you're looking at, it might say calories per gram per Celsius degree. But a Celsius degree is the same as a Kelvin, so it's uh, six of one and a half dozen of another. So for liquid water, you need to, and you've got a gram of it, you need one calorie, whether it's from sunlight or your cookout grill, you know, your charcoal briquettes, whatever your heat uh, source is, it's one calorie per gram. Now, solid water is lower. Okay, so for solid water, uh, in other words, H2O ice, it's 0 0.50 calories per gram Kelvin. And that means that to raise one calorie, excuse me, to raise one gram of H2O ice by one Kelvin, you need half a calorie, right? And then between liquid and solid is the phase transition. And as I mentioned last time, it's because of the crystalline bonds that can form below the freezing point of liquid water, 273 Kelvin, and are not quite able to form and stay formed above that temperature. And I mentioned that it is uh, electromagnetic potential energy, and it actually represents a lot of energy stored in the crystal lattice. And when you melt it, all that energy is released, uh, and so are extracted. Now, other substances you can look up, and I have a, a table here of uh, some specific heats for some substances, uh, everyday, common everyday substances. And I'm sure NASA has a specific heats uh, calculated for, you know, for like advanced rocket fuels and, you know, exotic alloys and stuff that they need for spacecraft and navigation in space. But for us, here's some common everyday things. Now, um, go ahead and jot down a few. We're going to do a clicker question in a second. And I've got this exact table, but I'm going to talk about this for a few minutes. Okay, the top of the table starts with liquid and solid H2O. We've talked about those. Next one down, glass. And this is a generic form of glass, so this would be an average, your average glass. Um, there, there's probably glass that, for instance, that they use in ovens, you know, that's uh, heat-tempered glass. Maybe it has a little bit different
specific heat, but 0.20 for glass. Ethanol, ethyl alcohol, 0.58. So that's a little bit different from, it's a little bit higher than, than water ice, but less than liquid water. Aluminum, 0.215 calories per gram. Gold, copper, silver. And I love this, this ring, it's Black Hills Gold, they call it, which is an alloy of gold and copper and silver. It's particularly lovely in, in my eyes anyways. So let's talk about these, these substances. Have your clicker ready, your first question. And I have the same, you can keep copying, here's the same table. First question, which one's harder to heat up gram for gram? Of those four metals, aluminum, gold, copper, or silver. Twenty seconds. You're going to have this table for a couple of slides, so don't worry about trying to copy it down. Just answer the question. Ten seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Abra, Cadabra. All right. Uh oh. We got some splaining to do. A lot of you voted for aluminum for some reason. But that's good because aluminum is the right answer. Now. All right, fake you out there a little bit. Now, for those of you uh, in the other, and there's a significant number over here, let's just explain this a little bit. If you voted for gold, copper, or silver, um, what you want to look at and think about are these numbers here and what they mean. And what they mean is every gram of aluminum, gold, copper, or silver requires this many calories to go up by a Kelvin. So gram for gram, Kelvin by Kelvin, if you have a higher number here, it means that you need a lot of energy to raise a gram by one Kelvin. Conversely, if you have a lower number here, well, let's go to the next question. Which substance is easier to heat up gram for gram? And again, focus on those last four numbers and the numeric relationship between them. Twenty seconds. Good. Ten. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Zip, zap. Huh. Well, looks like a lot of you voted, 86% of you voted for the correct answer, gold. And for those of you that voted elsewhere, just look at those numbers again. The lowest... The lowest number on this scale, or on this table is going to be the one that's easy. Because, you know, it only takes a little bit of energy to, to get that one gram up by one Kelvin. Okay, so gold is easiest. 
All right, now, in general, here's the formula that you use for heating stuff up. Uh, let me get this thing out of the way here. Hold on a second. All right, so here's the formula used for heat. Q equals MC delta T. Now, we went over this last time. The mass M basically tells how much you've got of the substance. C tells you or encodes the heat ability of, or the heat up ability of the substance that you have got. So that's why we had those questions. Delta T tells you um, uh, how, many, uh, how many kelvins you're raising or lowering the temperature. So you could be cooling it down. If you're cooling it down, this would be a negative number. By the way, if, you, if you've been looking at your highlights, I've started commenting some more in Chapter 5 and actually up into Chapter 6 now. And I noticed an error there in one of the uh, uh, formulas where they should have a negative delta T, but they don't. Anyway, so the, the specific heat tells you, for instance, you know, how easy is it, numerically how easy is it to, to heat up a gram by one Kelvin. Okay. Now, that's the heat up procedure. Q equals MC delta T. Now, at the phase transition... It's a little bit different. If you raise a hunk of ice up to 273 and then you stop adding energy to it, it's going to stay a piece of ice. Because it takes work to break those crystalline bonds apart and make it into liquid. And that's what the phase transition um, is about. Right? So you, it, the, the phase transition... You know, the, the amount of heat energy you need for that depends really only on how many atoms or molecules that you've got. And if it's a solid, you think of it as breaking it apart. If it's a liquid, then you think about it as uh, breaking down even the very weak liquid forces of cohesion that a liquid normally has. So basically, you have to figure out how much do you have and what phase transition do you have. And and what is the substance, okay? And so, the, so when you're at the uh, boiling point, when you're at the freezing point or melting point, you have to figure out, all right, how many grams have I got? And then I multiply it by this substance uh, called the specific heat, excuse me, uh, the, um, the latent heat. So capital L for latent, L-A-T-E-N-T, latent heat. Heat. The latent heat of fusion, that applies to melting and freezing. The latent heat of vaporization, that applies to vaporizing or boiling uh, or condensing, condensation. Now, uh, so this is the formula. So basically, just take how many grams you got and multiply it by the latent heat. And you guys, on exam three... The cover page is going to have a table of specific heats and latent heats and all that stuff. So don't worry about memorizing it. Here's a, here's a table, and you're going to have a clicker question about this in just a second. But let's talk about it first. Um, here are three metals. This is easy to look up. Here's the melting point, and here's the boiling point. All right, this is under normal uh, atmospheric pressure. Okay. Now, if you've ever had a, a pressure cooker, you know, it's, a, it's a, a device that you put on the stove, and it's, but it's got really strong clamps to keep it closed because if you heat it up under and keep, allow it to build up pressure, the food cooks really quickly. Okay? And so you can do things at higher pressures or lower pressures than you can't normally do or at different temperatures. But at standard, temper, at standard pressures... These are the melting points and boiling points. All right, here's the latent heat of fusion. Oh, and by the way, the latent heat of fusion for water, you better write this down. Uh, put this at the bottom of the table. Uh, for H2O, it's 80 calories per gram. It's quite a bit higher than these. Uh, gold is 15.4, silver 21, copper is 32. 
And then here's latent heat of vaporization. So if you're going to do some uh, vapor deposition of gold or silver or copper onto a surface of like carbon or something, um, then you have to uh, use this latent heat of vaporization as well as the boiling point uh, over here. Now, you're going to have some homework tonight involving water. Uh, but before we get to that, let's take uh, and ask a question here. Two questions. One of them is going to burn your brain. Um, but the first one is this. Uh, what salt is harder to melt gram for gram? And look at the table. So you're going to look at the first three columns and the bottom three rows of each of those columns. So don't worry about boiling point for this question. Don't wor worry about latent heat of vaporization for this question. 20 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, let's see what we got here. Aha. See that? You guys are learning. I got you right where I want you. You're thinking about it. And and if you didn't vote for that, just think of it this way. Every gram of copper requires 32 calories to melt. You know, you've got it up at the melting point, but it's going to stop, it's going to stay a solid until you put 32 more calories into each gram. And then you'll have... Can you please stop talking over there? I keep looking over there. You're not getting the message. Now I'm going to ask you to stop. Yeah, yeah, here I am. You got it? Yeah, I see you. You got it? All right, good. Try to be polite, but sometimes polite doesn't work. All right, now, tougher question. Question number four. I don't know. I'll do it. Here we go. Which solid has tougher metallic bonds between its atoms? Okay, 15 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We got some splaining to do. All right. Do you want to know what the right answer is? No. Thirteen percent of you got it right. Now, here's the, here's what I want you to think about with this. 
Um, let me back this table up a little bit. All right, I'll back it up right to here. A lot of you chose copper, and that's that's not a bad first decision. Okay, gram for gram, copper does require more energy to bust it all apart. But here's what this table doesn't tell you. How many copper atoms are there in one gram of copper? Right? How many? And isn't gold really heavy? Right? I mean, a gold bar, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's really hard to, you know. But copper is not that heavy. So, uh, so which is going to have more atoms? A gram of copper or a gram of gold? Copper. Copper. For one gram, it takes a lot more copper atoms. Uh, gold atoms are heavy. So if you were... Fewer of them makes up a, 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 a gram or a kilogram, whatever you want to measure. All right? So that's not encoded in this table. But guess what table that is encoded in? The periodic table. So we've got some more work to do to figure out um, everything ab about these metallic bonds. But this does tell you, okay, so here's the answer. This does tell you uh, uh, something. It does tell you, you know, at least at first glance, you know, copper might still win, but you know, you've got to you've got to be able to factor in the the um, the number of uh, copper atoms uh, versus gold atoms. It might be gold. It might be silver. I don't know, but you could you could calculate it. I'm sure. Now, I want to do an example with you that we tried to work on last time, um, and that's to melt a small piece of ice. We're just, and, and we're not going to do copper today. We're not going to melt copper or anything, gold or anything. We're just going to do some water, okay? And then you're gonna, your homework tonight is going to be doing some of this. So take good notes of this calculation that we're about to do, all right? Now... We're going to melt a piece of ice, uh, a hundredth of a kilogram, 10 grams. And by the way, uh, when I'm doing thermo with you guys, I'm usually going to be in grams. And this, the quantities are going to be oriented to grams, not kilograms. But, and joules, you know, you could use joules and kilograms if you want. But I, I tend to use calories and grams. All right, so let's think of the two temperatures for the ice. Let's say that it's that I want to take a hunk of ice that's initially 266 Kelvin. Okay, so that's a little bit below the melting point, 273. And I want to raise it a little bit above the melting point to 275. All right. Now this is a process in which I have to uh, heat the ice. Then I have to melt the ice, and then I have to heat the liquid water from 273 up to 275. Let me repeat that so you can jot it down. We have to first heat the ice with its specific heat. And then when it's at the melting point, we then melt it using the latent heat of fusion for H2O. And then once we've got it all melted, uh, all 10 grams of it, then we've got to um, raise the temperature of the liquid water. All right, now the liquid water has got a different specific heat. So we have three calculations. No, no one of these three calculations is that difficult, but it's still kind of tricky getting them all organized. So let's just go through it step by step. All right, so first one. MC delta T for the heating of the ice. Here's your formula, MC delta T. And so Q1 is, M is 10 grams. And that's going to be the same all through this problem. We're not going to, you know, lose. There's no uh, 
ice burglars in this problem. In other words, it's not going to evaporate. Uh, here's the specific heat for H2O ice, 0 0.50 calories per gram Kelvin. And here's the difference in temperature from 273. Well, that's the last temperature I can heat something as ice because that's where ice will melt. Okay, so I'm going from 266 up to 273, that's 7 Kelvin, and I'm raising it, so this is a positive 7 Kelvin. All right? And that works out to, I don't know, what does it work out to? Uh, 5 times 7, 35. All right, so write that down. That's part of your energy budget for this process. And then your second heating is from 273 up to your final temperature of 275. All right, so Q2 is still 10 grams of water, okay, here, the first parentheses here at the bottom of the slide, and then the middle parentheses, 1.00 calorie per gram Kelvin, and why is that? Because now at 273, I've got liquid water, all right? And then here's how far I'm uh, raising the temperature. I'm just going up to 275. I could go up to 1,005 if I want, you know, and you know, have to deal with different temperatures. But, but for this one, 275 is all I want. All right. And that works out to be, let's see, 10 times 1 is 10. 10 times 2 is 20. So I got 35 from the first and 20 from the second. But notice I haven't figured out the melting uh, requirement yet, and that's the third thing that we have to do, okay? So for every gram of ice, H2O ice, at 273, I've got to bust that thing up into liquid, and that's going to requ require 80 calories for every gram, right? So for us, that's going to be 800 more calories. So first I use 35 calories to bring it up to 273, and then at 273, I bust it apart with another 800 calories of busting up energy. And then once I've got it liquefied, then I can heat it up, and it's a little tougher to heat. I need, I'm only going 2 Kelvin. I'm not going 5, but I still need... 20 calories to get it up another 2 Kelvin. So here's the total energy budget for this process. 35 plus 800 plus 20. Right? And that adds up to 855 uh, for this task. All right? Now, you're going to do a clicker question here for the next few minutes. And... It's going to be the same kind of a calculation, but I see a few hands. Uh, and um, young lady way in the back with a black shirt with white stripes. Raise your hand. Yeah. Okay. Did you have a question? Because I saw you, you know, kind of just double checking. Okay. Those of you guys uh, right here first. How did I get 80 and 800? The latent heat of fusion is how many calories I need for every gram. And I've got 10 grams, so 80 times 10. All right. And that's the amount of energy I need to break apart, apart the crystals and so that they're still, they're, they're still not completely loose as a gas, but they're now as a liquid. Another question. Yeah. Quickly summarize the steps I just took. Okay, students, I have a three-word summary. Heat, melt, heat. And hey, you guys, Shai can, and, you know, and Darianne, when she gets back to class, will be able to tell you that every semester, the heat, melt, heat is a big brain burner. And, but it's, it's worth doing. So you're heating here. You're heating here. You're melting here. I kind of put that part in the outline. And then you're heating liquid water here. Okay, so heat, melt, heat. Another question.
Uh, somebody in the middle had a question? Okay, let's try it. Uh, hit your refresh key, please. And let's try a heat melt heat calculation. Uh, and what we're going to do is go to the... The island called Greenland. All right, so here's your problem. Take a few minutes to work on this. And since I now have a wireless mic, I can walk around the classroom. Instead of being tethered to my laptop. Okay. Heat melt heat. So you're going from 260 up to 273. So that's 13. As ice. And then from 273 up to 300. So that's another 27 kelvins as liquid water. And then Melt is 120 G's, 120 grams. So when you did the heating to the melting point, then from the melting point, are you at the melting point, is that At the melting point, let me put it this way ice water, in other words, water with ice cubes in it will stay that way indefinitely because liquid and solid water can coexist at that temperature perfectly fine. But if you add heat to it, you know, like if the if you're in a, uh, you know how you go to the grocery store, they have those big freezers you can walk into. If they set that to 32 Fahrenheit and you in there with a glass of ice water, it would stay that way, you know. You know, it wouldn't it wouldn't turn it wouldn't melt any of the ice. It wouldn't freeze any of the water. It would stay at that. So that's why you have to, you know, at that getting it to that temperature, you still need extra energy to melt the ice, melt that crystal apart <coughs> to make it liquid. Yeah. So, and on that calculation that we just did in in the in the notes, I did the two heating processes, but really it's it's heat melt heat. Because I just want to do the two yeah. MC delta T's together. Question. The, the 2K right here. 2K? Yeah, how did you um, that? Because that was, the final temperature was 275. See? Okay. See up there, 1B? Yeah. Okay, so from 273 up to 275 is 2 Kelvin. Okay. Now this one, your your final is 300. So from 273 up to 300, that's going to be 27. Okay, so this is a little, and when you when you're working on the homework tonight and burning your brains to to a crisp, you're gonna have all. Well, it's gonna be different each time you take it. How you doing here? All right. Good. For the melting part, if it's water, yes, 80 times whatever your mass is. Because that, that's like the, a property of, of solid water. Yeah, so like CO2 ice, you know how I we went up to that high pressure and we, we went from solid to liquid? Yeah. You know? Um, it, might, it might be a different number. It might be 22.4 or 103.9 or something like that. But for water, it's 80. Okay. And it's actually 79.8 something, but we always go with 80. So, all right? So that's easy every time. Okay. And the specific heat, that's a property too. So, whose power cable is this? Very good. Okay, good. All right. Do you have a question? Point 0.5 is the specific heat of water ice. Mm-hmm. 
for, for water ice, yes. Now, if we use CO2 ice, it's not the same, but water ice, 0 0.5. And that's from the initial temperature, 266, up to the boiling point, or to the uh, melting point, 7 Kelvin. Yes, we started at 266, and we went up to 273, so that's 6 Kelvin. Yeah, multiply those out, and then add them. And then don't forget, and is that for your um, your melting? 80 times, yeah, 80 times 120. Yeah, yeah, that's how you do it. So just do those numbers out. Come on, hurry up. Yeah, multiply these three numbers, and you get a number. Multiply these three, you get another number. And then take this third number and add them all together. Okay? Sound, sound all right? Good. Question. So, you did all that math. Good gravy. Well, all, now you got the easy part. You just add them up. Yeah. Yeah, so the total heat budget is, for the heat melt heat, is, so heat, is this, is your, is this your heat? Oh, okay, so where's your heating? For the okay, here's your first heat. Oh, you still have to do the melting though, right? Latent heat times how many grams you got? Remember, you you have to want yeah, that's right. Times 80 for every gram. 80 calories per gram. Mm-hmm. By this time, it's going to be a little different number because you got more grams. But, yeah, so now you just add, add that, right, and then add this. So this, there's your two. And that's your, that's your total heat budget. So if you're going to go to Progress to Duke Energy and say, I need enough energy to melt this ice up with another pole, you just ask them what I need to how many calories of energy. And they say, okay, I can give you that for a dollar twenty-two or whatever the price is. Okay, how are you doing here? Hmm? Good. Good. That's good. I like. This. I like. You know, students helping students is very efficient, very effective. Boston Red Sox hat. That's that's like dream on, man. See, but you know the Mets. You got your revenge on the Mets because they got humiliated in the World Series. You know. So, question. Yeah, but that's the problem that we worked on about 10 minutes ago. This this one we're doing a little different. We're going from 260 up to 273. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's always delta T. From the initial up to the melting point, and then from the melting point up to the final. Do you want me to confirm if that's the right answer or not? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure. Like, I don't want to tell people the wrong answer. Yeah. Well, what do you think? Tell them what you think. Oh, well, I don't, like, this is the answer that I got, but I don't want to, like, say that that's the answer. No, then don't. If you're not confident yet, we're just starting this, so if you're not confident, you don't have to. I'm not going to tell you if that's the right answer until we're done. I'm going to text you back now. Okay. All right, all right, so tell them what you put in. But they might be risking, they're not risking their life or limb, but 
The question is, does it seem reasonable? Does it does it make sense? Does it fit together? Okay. Well, we'll go over it in just a minute. No. Did you get an answer yet? Yeah. No. Mm-hmm. Three hundred and sixty. Good. All right. Let's see how many answers we got here. Well, I've made one circumnavigation of our lecture hall. Okay, 30 seconds to get your final answer in. And I did see some people with the correct answer. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Oops. Whoa. Raise your hand if you got 13,620. See, I didn't want to tell you, but I could. Now, hold on. That's looking good, 72%. Now, your homework tonight, we're gonna, we have some more lecture notes to do, but your homework tonight is going to contain that and some additional brain burners. Now, I want to go to Chapter 6 Concepts. And let's try to work through some of this before we dismiss. If, if you want an explanation of how that uh, one was done, uh, I'll post a discussion posting about that specific problem after class this afternoon. Um, but it's basically like the one we did together with the 10 grams. It's just a different mass. Okay, uh, Waves, This is. has anybody ever been to Portugal? I've never been over there. This is a, this is a place over in the coast of Portugal where... Look at this. Look at this wave. This little... This little thing here, that's a man. That's somebody that's a, about maybe six feet tall. Now multiply. Shh, shh, shh. Visually multiply. How many times taller is the wave than he is? It's got to be ten. Ten or more. Can you, and look at these guys. These guys are up on a cliff. They're up on a cliff. Above the beach. You can't even see the bottom. They're looking down at the bottom. You can't even see it. This, my friend, is a wave. And it's this, this place in Portugal where they just get gigantic waves. Now, last time I mentioned the Yellowstone mantle plume, the Yellowstone hotspot. It is a place on our planet where a blob of heat is blobbing, convecting up to the surface, we think, from the core of the earth, a hot spot, nobody knows why. And one of the ways that they have figured it out is by studying the seismic waves. So they put, they study the uh, earthquakes, arrival times, there's all kinds of earthquakes up there in Yellowstone, and they analyze the seismic waves. And if they have enough seismic stations, they can analyze the arrival times of the same quake at different stations and figure out 
uh, where underneath Yellowstone the waves travel at a different speed. And that is significant because the slower seismic waves means that the uh, magma is less rigid and, it, and it's less rigid because it's hotter. Therefore, it's a, a convection. You know, from way 700 kilometers down uh, under the surface of the Earth. So this is an enormous plume of energy. So let's get down to some basic specs uh, for waves. So let's take some notes. And here's your number one concept. Uh, waves transport energy and momentum across space-time, but they themselves do not transport matter, not necessarily. So when we get a wave here in Florida that started over on the, in the Cape Verde Islands off the west coast of Africa, that's not water from the Cape Verde Islands that's washing up at Cocoa Beach. It's wave energy and wave momentum that's transferred across the ocean uh, by the wave phenomena in, in surface waves of the ocean. Uh, now, we do have ways to get water from the Cape Verde Islands over here. And that's called currents, ocean currents. But waves are not the same. So yes, they do deposit energy and momentum, but not necessarily the matter through which they wave. They're not easily localized, usually. Sometimes we can localize a pulse of waves with a laser and, and so forth. But this is another property of waves. In other words, you know, you're looking at the waves in the ocean. Uh, do you mean the wave that just passed you by or the one that's coming at you or the one that just left you or the one five minutes from now or what? You know, where's the, you know, it doesn't really have an edge, doesn't have a center of mass, but it does communicate energy and momentum. So it behaves way differently than a Newtonian particle. So Sir Isaac Newton, F equals MA, works lovely uh, for uh, particles, baseballs, um, volleyballs, and so forth. But there are some things that uh, particles do not do. For instance, diffractions. Diffraction. When you, you have a, a wave that goes through a gap in a wall or something like that, um, uh, an edge, you know, it looks something like this. That is diffraction. When a wave comes in, here's the incoming wave down here, and they come in flat, all lined up like waves way out in the ocean, just kind of coming in all, you know, big train of waves. But then when they come through this gap here, they seem to spread out on the other side. And our theory is that there are wavelets generated here at the gap, as if it's a new source of waves. Very heavy mathematics behind that, very powerful mathematics. But picture-wise, this says it all. And my wonderful students, if you were taking graduate-level quantum mechanics, the instructor would probably show a diagram like this on the first day of class. Simple wave equation, V equals lambda F. Very, very simple. Uh, we'll stop there. Homework 15 will be ready by supper time. Uh, due on Thursday. You're dismissed. We'll start reading chapter 6. We'll see you on Thursday. You're dismissed.